everybody, and welcome to an epi- another episode of Connect with KB. It's so great to have you tuning in as we talk about business and education and leadership and all the wonderful things that connect us to each other. The Lansing Regional Chamber of Commerce and the Lansing Economic Area Partnership recently partnered with 10 leading business and education stakeholders to develop the first state of the Lansing Region benchmarking report. Here to talk about the findings, it's the president and CEO of the Lansing Regional Chamber, Tim Damon, and the president of TA Forsberg, Brent Forsberg, who I believe was one of the stakeholders in all of this. So happy to have you guys here. Welcome to Connect with KB. Thank, thank you for you, having us. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Oh, you guys sound good in yeah, unison. Yeah, in unison. It was <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's great. Uh, Tim, I'm going to start with you. And congratulations on the leadership. Um, the chamber always has this opportunity to kind of step out into the region and uh, try and connect people, which is one of those words that I just love. So you've done a great job doing that. Talk a little bit about the reason for commissioning the report in the first place. Well, I, I think when we assessed the, the region and where we are currently, um, with the growth that we've had, you know, we, we looked at this and said we, we've had you know, what, over three billion dollars, I think, right now in, in planned development or current development that's underway. But it's like, okay, what what's next? And then we were kind of looking around the state as well. And our good friends in Detroit and Sandy Brew and the Detroit Regional Chamber, they've been doing a very similar report for the last three to five years. And we kind of looked at that as a model. And so what if we did something like that here in the Lansing region to just to kind of assess and let us know where we are? And where do we need to get to? Who are we competing with? And so I think that was really what kind of drove us in, in doing that. And we looked at the regions, and by far that was the toughest part of it was cutting the regions down. I think we started with about 30 regions that we wanted to benchmark ourselves against, and we were able to kind of narrow it down to 11. And you know what? They were um, they're they're were striving to be much better. There, you know, we could have picked other regions and kind of probably ended up um, in better position of where we ended up in the rankings, but these are the regions we're competing with. And this is something that Bob Scherzeis and Leap really kind of helped us guide. And so it really kind of focuses on the upper uh, upper Midwest and touches down into the Southeast and communities like Nashville, Tennessee and Greenville, South Carolina, to Minneapolis, to Indianapolis and Columbus, and really kind of looking at research universities and state capitals as kind of being the hubs for those regions that, uh, that we picked. And so I think it was really, you know, Kristen, at the end of the day, it was really to kind of, how do we set our region up for the next five, 10, 20 years with what and how this is gonna look for us from a competitive standpoint. What was one of the most interesting things that you found uh, when you started this dialogue? Where where was that really kind of eye opener for you? So I think there, you know, three things come to mind and two were, I think, just surprises. One was the high percentage of Gen Z population we have. I think we rank number two of the 11 regions and um, that certainly bodes well for the future workforce, right? These are the individuals that are just now getting into the workforce and entering the workforce, maybe it's first jobs in high school or they're getting into college and so forth. And so, you know, for a region, how do we keep that, uh, you know, those folks here as they're progressing through, um, you know, high school and in, into college. The other one that really kind of surprised all of us was that we ranked number one in exports. And, you know, when we kind of dug down and drilled down a little deeper and it was really around the transportation manufacturing area, which makes sense with GM here. And I know that some of the products that are built here are getting shipped internationally, but uh, the export piece was was, uh, was, uh, was something that can really surprise us as well. And those were both kind of on, I think, on the, the pleasant surprise size. And the other surprise we had, at least for me, was the small private sector that we have here. I mean, we have a very, very small private sector. And I think we've all talked about that. We know we're home and state government and a higher ed, uh, you know, um, uh, significance here in the region, but we have a very small private sector. And I think again, when we drill down into it, it's a statewide issue as well. I think even when you look at Grand Rapids and Ann Arbor, a couple of the regions we benchmarked uh, were very low in that area as well. Brent, what was a takeaway for you? And as president of TA Forsberg, uh, you know your real estate really well, <laughs> and you know the community really well. And so uh, I think you were probably a really great fit for the study. What did you see it, or take away from it? Yeah, so you know, for me, what the important part was is to figure out where we're going to go as a region, where are we right now, and where have we been? You know, we are a product of the last 50 years of the policies and economics and design and growth. So having this as the starting point that we can say, okay, this is where we're ranking. Here's areas that have seen the growth because we can look back to, uh, as Tim brought up, Nashville and see the exponential growth that they've had in certain periods. And then we can look at, okay, we haven't had that. You know, our region, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? We don't have the bigs up, ups and downs like a lot of the other communities do of these huge rises in price and growth curves. But at the same time, it's also in a market right now where we see 
some of the supply chain issues, and especially in housing and the affordability in housing, it doesn't give us that that room to have that flexibility to be able to absorb the pricing thing. So having this report to be able to look at it and say, here's where we are now, and now we can create an understanding of where we want to go. And this is where groups like LEAP and the Chamber are just so important to help lead those discussions because we need to know that, okay, we need X amount of job growth in the private sector that, hey, this is an important piece and this is a gap that we now have that's identified that we can help grow. Because as people come from the university, I think MSU, I don't know if uh, the statistic still holds, was number two brain drain in the country. So those are people that are getting educated, living here, and then going to other areas. So we can now figure out how do we realign our workforce and potential opportunities for them and the quality of life that we have to offer to keep them here and have it continue to grow. Well, I thought that the um, video that Steve Curran and the Harvest Creative did over there and the whole quote on Lewis Carroll on, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And this really gives the region uh, a roadmap, really to look in and drill down. How are you going to assess the progress? What's that going to look like, Tim? And, and like, you know, kind of where, and, and I know it just came out, but how do you get started? Yeah, so that, that's a work in progress. And I will tell you, the one thing that impacted, you know, the, the report and the data was captured pre-COVID. And then with COVID, it, you know, we were a year from the time the report was ready to be released until the time we released it. And so I think right now it's a kind of a work in progress, Kristen, kind of putting together those measurables. But the good thing is that, and we even notated it on the website, there's a lot of work that's already occurring in each of these areas now. So I think when you kind of look at the, you know, the talent and education aspect and some of the things that are happening in the region here, and certainly from a private sector growth around the entrepreneurial initiatives at the university some of the things that LEAP are doing and others in the community. So, and that was one thing I think we wanted to be very, um, you know, very cautious on that we weren't creating or trying to create something new here as much as we're trying to take and align resources that we have. And I think Brent sort of said it here, I think from an efficiency standpoint, how are we all working together around these common goals? And that's, I think, one of the things we're trying to do right now is to get that alignment in place that it has to be focused on population, um, you know, growth. It has to be focused on educational attainment, the private sector, uh, investment and job growth. And then this affordability piece, and you know, Brent mentioned it a couple of times, I think we've always viewed that as being a negative for our region. And we're trying to flip that, I think, right now that, you know what, we, ha- we have a high quality of life here and you can do it at a very affordable, um, you know, affordable price. And so, and I think right now with the remote work aspect, I know this kind of takes off topic a little bit, but who knows what this is going to look like. It is unreasonable to think that we're going to have people maybe moving into our region, living here, that are not working for businesses that are outside of, uh, certainly outside of this region, outside of the state, outside of the country, possibly. Well, and COVID probably has done that in regards to letting people, you know, be a little more free in regards to where they live and uh, being able to work remote. I was on the phone with a friend of mine uh, who lives in New Jersey this morning and she was telling me about you know she just downsized and went to a thousand square foot home and is still paying nine thousand dollars in taxes a year (laughs) so wow you know when you look at the affordability of our region it really there is it's not comparing apples to apples with that type of thing out there east tell me a little bit about the other findings on here you know we talked a little bit about uh, more areas of economic prosperity and opportunity and the population growth but educational attainment and that kind of thing did um, did the president of MSU get engaged in the report too and is this kind of aligned with where they're going so MSU was a, both MSU and LCC were both stakeholders which you know we felt really good about having the two higher ed institutions as uh, you know as part of this and so I think it, if, if nothing more, they have to be both at the center of, of where this goes in our, in our region. I think if you start talking about growing our private sector here, um, you know, you, you can do it in a, in a couple of ways. One, you're attracting business in, and we know that that's a long process. And that certainly is a di- much different game today than it was, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You can do it organically and growing business here. And a lot of that starts with the entrepreneurial initiatives that MSU has, uh, you know, undertaken, and clearly with what's happening, you know, through an R&D standpoint, where we where we fare very well. And then thirdly, you grow your current business base here. And at the end of the day, that's still something I think it's like 80% of all new jobs that are created are created by businesses that are already here in your region. So, uh, so I think having both MSU and LCC part of this, they both have bought into it. Uh, 100% have been supportive of it from, um, you know, from the, the initial launch. And so we think that uh, we think that they're critical partners with what and how this region will continue to look like going into the future. Brent, you have um, 
been very engaged in sustainability and place-based development. And what did you see how the region can change a little bit in regards to kind of some of the work that you're doing? And let's talk a little bit about Tembo and your yeah. homes and what's going on uh, in Eaton Rapids. And just your vision is different. And are you getting that from other regions throughout the country or... Is this just Brent Forsberg sitting around, just smoke coming off the top of your head? <laughs> well, no, it's definitely not that. I mean, it is it is lots of research and looking at what's going on around the country. And and a lot of it started in 2014-15 with Tri-County Regional Planning's uh, Urban Sustainability Initiative with Portland State University. So I was lucky enough to be part of that group that got to look at what types of programs in affordability are going on around the country, which, you know, and, It all comes down for me to one thing. What's the experience that we're creating for people where they live? Because that's that's what it comes down to, right? We're a value proposition, and that's what we have to show. And it's the entire system that we live within. So for me, those quality of life metrics, you have the affordability because people want to have money to be able to experience the restaurants and go see art and for us too, just the natural assets we have here. I mean, how many people are canoeing on that on the river? daily. I mean, it's just amazing. So what I try to look at is how do we combine all of that together? And one of the biggest things that I can influence is housing. So what we're looking at is, okay, we know that the cost of housing is exponentially rising. We also know that housing has been built pretty much the same way for the last 120 years. So what can we do? And that's what we've started looking at. And the Tembo project was one of them that was our first look at, at how do we change the conversation around what housing is? And it was looking back to the 1930s, where the average square foot per person in a house was 235 feet. By the time we hit 2016, we were at 1,008 feet, I think, plus or minus a little bit. So we just had this kind of growth, and that's come from the policies that we put in, because the easiest thing that you can do is, as we've made houses more complicated in their energy efficiency and the materials that we're putting in, the regulation that's come on top of them, it's added over 25% to the cost of a house just in the regulations. And then we set this idea that it's a zero tolerance, right? We have to build these more energy sustainable houses, where yet we have housing stock in Lansing. I think the average age right now in Lansing is 1964. That we have nothing in between that we can look at of, of how do we get something incrementally better to address the issue, but we have this all or nothing model. So that's what we're working on is how do we look at this? How do we make some adjustments to the model and start those conversations? Because they're gonna be important moving forward. The last 70 years has created this income stratification and this affordability stratification in housing that we've seen that is now uh, the second pandemic, really. I mean, it's, it's hurting our neighborhoods, it's hurting our communities, and we're seeing the stress on people. So. Our, what we try to do is how do we how do we address that? And that's what we're looking at is what are the policies and what are the things we can do to change that moving forward? Tell me a little bit about then how has it been received? I mean, are a lot of people who kind of going into this new kind of concept and trying to downsize? I mean, a lot of people, you know, in, in my age bracket are trying to get out of houses that are too big and move into something smaller. So how has that been received in the communities? I think you started in Rio Town and then out in Eaton Rapids as well, right? Yeah. So uh, it, it has been received. Received well. We've got a few folks that have moved into it. We've we've ran into some uh, roadblocks with the costing in the last sure. year, um, but also you know with policy because you know the, even in the city of Lansing, while there isn't a square footage requirement, there is a foundation dimension requirement, and then you get into the setbacks. So we have all of these city lots and things that could be built on, but it, but it is the there's a lot of process that has been put in place over time. And it's important to have the regulations to protect neighborhoods. But at the same time, some of these policies have, have put a lot of encumbrances to do this. So it, I, over across the country, it's very well accepted. I mean, I was out in Portland again three weeks ago looking at their new ADU models. And then I was in the West Denver neighborhoods looking at their models of affordability. And, and it's accepted out there. It's working. They're putting it together. So it'll be here. And, you know, everything starts at the coast and then works its way in. You guys probably ought to take some of our um, local officials on a little field trip and let them see firsthand the opportunities for here in the region. You know, KB, so So one thing that Brent said in the housing stock in Lansing, thinking about that, going back to average is 1964. 
that's a challenge without with what and how you attract and keep young families in the city, right? Because the housing stock is not there for them. So when you start talking about that affordability and the housing stock and population attraction, how we're attracting people into the region, those things work so much in tandem and they have to be aligned and, and whatnot. So that's uh, that's something I know that there's, there's a lot of talk right now about that in the city of Lansing and what and how we, we increase and change that housing stock so we can keep the young families here. Yeah. How, what other kind of feedback did you receive from the partners and the stakeholder who, who were involved, especially those who have a footprint down here in downtown Lansing? Well, I think all the partners seem to be very, um, you know, with outside of the, the roadblock we had or this, the, you know, with, with COVID and not being able to get the report out in the time that we wanted to do it. I think all the partners were very pleased with the initial one. It was a three-time commitment. And so we're going to have a couple more reports coming out here probably in the next three to four years and really try to begin measuring and benchmarking some of the, the key pieces we have of this. Let's see how we're, let's see how we're doing. You know, we're doing great now. And this is the, the great thing about this as well is that there wasn't a crisis that drove this, right? So we're doing very very well as a region. This was, as Brent said, how do we kind of set this region up for future growth and kind of align a regional vision here? You bet. How do people get to the report, Tim? You know what? They can do that through the Lansing Chamber website. So lansingchamber.org and then backslash uh, state of the state of the Lansing region. Super. Guys, thanks so much for coming on with me. The 15 minutes went by quick, didn't it? It did. Thank yes, you so much. You so. bet. Absolutely. I want to thank my guest, Tim Damon, President and CEO of the Lansing Regional Chamber, and Brent Forsberg, President of TA Forsberg. I also want to thank my supporting sponsors, Marketing Resource Group, Doubting Industries, Governmental Consultant Services, AF Group, AT&T, the Michigan Chamber of Commerce, and the Fraser Law Firm. You can listen to all my podcasts at connectwithkb.com. Until we connect again, go live your best life. I'm your host, Kristen Belzer.